So our next speaker has been building web-based products and services for more than two decades. Uh, he's been with Agility, building and managing their CSM CMS platform since 2005, and is ready to share his experiences with you. Also the father of two awesome young adults, a high school football coach, and a musical theater director. Please welcome to the stage, Joel Vardy. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for coming out on a Sunday. This is great. Um, yeah, I'm Joel Vardy. Really interested to see who's in the audience today. So just a show of hands if you consider yourself a web developer. All right, pretty much everybody. Okay, got it. Um, anyone consider themselves a software architect on top of that? You ever thought of yourself that way? Okay. It's an interesting way to kind of think about yourself. Um, I think we should all be software architects if we're developers, but you know, it kind of depends on where you are in your career. Uh, anyone in the audience consider themselves just like a student, uh, not quite gotten ready to go to that next level? Okay, cool. Awesome that you're here. It's a great way to boost your career. I think it's for everyone. Uh, these kind of conferences are great to come to to boost up your career. I know that uh, this has been a thing that I've used throughout my career. This is my first time, by the way, speaking in front of a live audience in like five, six years. So it's been a while. Um, forgive me for all the mess ups. Where would I rather be on a Sunday? Uh, I was just backstage. That's my son uh, playing football. So he's playing football right now. So I'll try not to rush through this to get to the third quarter, but uh, that's what he's doing. That's where a bit of my brain is. What do I do for fun? Um, I'm a musical theater director, so that's me directing a bunch of kids in The Sound of Music last spring. So I hope that all of you have great hobbies that take you away from your computer a little bit, because that's a great way to kind of open your mind to other things. So there's a few things of me doing other things on stage, so that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Oh my God, Lord Farquaad, are you kidding me? All right. My story, a little bit about me. So back in the early dot-com pre-boom era, I started my career building web apps, um, web clients, we used to call them, based on Lotus Notes apps. Anyone even heard of Lotus Notes? Hey, oh my goodness. Well, that's actually more than I thought. Good for you. Um, so the whole idea was, hey, Notes is this client that runs on like Windows and the web is going to be this thing. And that's what I came out of University of Guelph, uh, kind of knew a little bit about. I knew some Java, wasn't sure the difference between Java and JavaScript at the time. Um, figured that out and did that for, for quite some time. Um, and then I started at Agility in uh, around 2005. It was called Identity back then, but we were actually an agency. So we're a SaaS software company, but we were an agency for a lot of years, building websites and custom web apps. And the interesting thing there is that the idea of building a headless CMS came out of just what we needed. And I think for the longest time, and even now, the biggest competition to headless CMS is internal development teams that thinks, I can I just build CMS. It's easy. I'll just build, I just use my own thing. I build a little min with a database. And many of you may have done that. I did that. Um, and then it grew so complicated and so, so kind of in-depth and, and specialized and whatnot. Um, that it became its own product, and we stopped building websites and let our partners do that, and just became a SaaS company. So, question, uh, hands up, if anyone built a CMS before, or just said, you know, I can build my own CMS. Kudos, it's not easy to do, um, but this isn't about specifically CMS, this is more about your trajectory of your career and how the idea of services fit into that, like a service that you can build. Uh, so in 2010, um, was when, so if you, you know, when you're around old developers like me, the idea of when did you move to cloud or when did you start using cloud is kind of a thing. Whereas now, if you're starting out, the cloud is sort of assumed. Um, but we moved all of our stuff to the cloud in 2010. And a lot of companies, if you get a job at sort of some big companies, they're still doing that. A lot of big companies are still doing move from on-premise to cloud. Not everyone is on the cloud, um, but certainly it's a, it's a big consideration for when you build things, where will it be? Um, I have built services not just for CMS. At one point, um, Agility decided it was going to compete with like the DXPs out there that have like every single possible service. So we built UGC, we built a commerce service, uh, built search. All of those are still running, by the way. Um, more or less uh, different sort of versions of those are out there to compete with with other stuff. A lot of it's just running because clients use it, and we just keep 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 it up for them. Um, we doubled down. Um, as a company, and sort of, it was, I think, driven by me, I am the CTO, um, we decided, let's not try to do everything. Let's just be really, really good at just content. 
Um, and this would build really great SDKs. And it was around 2018 that we did that. We decided we're not going to build websites anymore. We're not going to try to be everything for everyone. We're going to be very specific about what we do. And as a web developer, how did that make me feel? I felt really empowered because, uh, well, you'll kind of feel, you kind of see how that goes. So this, that's my story. And it'll be interesting to see for you, for your story, you know, if you stay in this industry long enough, kind of what are your major bullet points. And it's always a good thing to do to try to draw that out. Okay, I was a .NET guy. Assuming you all know what Microsoft.NET is. Um, what that is has changed a lot since I started with .NET in like 2000 whatever. Um, but I was pr pretty much building everything with ASP.NET, SQL Server, big monolithic apps, everything all in one, all that sort of stuff. But around 2019, as I was saying before, 2018, 2019, I started exploring other frameworks and other things and thinking, maybe C Sharp, yes, my favorite language, but maybe it's not the only thing. Maybe there's other things that I can be doing. And essentially, I consider myself as having really evolved a lot at that point, and I think it's a really interesting sort of thing to be introspective about of the other stuff that's out there. People have a lot of opinions um, in the software industry, and I think everything evolves, and we should be looking at that at any, each point in our career, what is the kind of state of things? So the frameworks that I like to work with right now, I love Next.js, I still love .NET, use it all the time, there's different versions. Astro's a cool framework, Gatsby's still a cool framework. Um, there's Laravel, Remix, all these things. That's what developers are using. They're trying to use modern stuff, but a lot of people are using really, really old stuff because the companies they work at or the services that they keep, keep running are really, really old. So no judgment, no opinions on that, but certainly be open to those things. Looking at the Stack Overflow, anybody not use Stack Overflow? It's interesting how that's kind of maybe the chat GPT is kind of moving people away from there, but certainly, by the way, chat, uh, Stack Overflow is a great example of a .NET monolithic app, by the way, so look at the architecture for that. But 50% of developers consider themselves full stack or back end. The assumption would be that the other 50% consider themselves front end, uh, but I'm not sure that that's true. A huge percentage of people know JavaScript or consider JavaScript their primary language. 38% uh, said TypeScript, um, I think that those are inclusive of each other, by the way. 50%, almost 50% of developers know SQL. So SQL is a really important, that's like more of a back-end data language, uh, for, so that's really interesting. Almost 70% of the developers that filled out this survey were 70%, uh, were, were full-time employees. All right, so that's really interesting that, you know, I, I don't know if any of you out there are freelancers or if you're contract workers, um, the vast majority of people that fill out this survey are not. A huge percentage have admiration for what I consider fairly newish or evolving quickly modern frameworks like React, Node, and Next.js. So that's in, just kind of an interesting thing of like a look at the, the, this is where kind of I looked at the industry and what do I want to kind of target for the service that I'm building that developers are going to use. Uh, so just a lot of thinking that kind of goes around that and I continue to evolve that thinking as much as I can. Now the title of this slide is Mock. Uh, anyone know what Mock means? Heard of it before? Yeah, it's not, it's not really that well known yet. It's a fairly new kind, kind of thing. Um, by the way, if you're in Europe, you say MAC, <laughs> the MAC Alliance. Uh, I call it MOC, whatever. Uh, jury's still out and how we're supposed to pronounce that thing. This is a, basically a group of companies that all believe in a similar way of building services for the web that kind of work together. You also, you might have heard of the composable web or composable services. This, the Mock Alliance really fits into that paradigm. It's more of an enterprise software type of thing, um, but in the SaaS software as a service kind of world, there's enterprise where essentially all the money is made, um, and then there's everybody else. Um, and then as a developer, you are, by the way, as a developer, you are the decision makers. Think of yourself that way. You are the person that has a ton of influence in your organization for deciding how that organization is gonna move forward because every company is a technology company. And as a developer, you are a technologist who knows stuff. And you're probably smarter and have sort of looked at the world a lot different from a lot of other people. So the Mock Alliance is pretty cool because it kind of celebrates that. And Agility is part of that Mock Alliance, by the way. So it's an acronym. Uh, microservices, so individual pieces of business functionality that are independently developed. So you can build a monolith or you can build a microservice. API first, so these are services that 
everything that is available in that service is available through an API. I actually just had a conversation backstage where someone says, oh, that's kind of like the AWS thing that, you know, where they said not everything's going to be calling back to the same database, but we're going to make services throughout the company. So that's essentially was how AWS kind of came about. Um, so this, I think, is kind of piggybacking on top of that idea. Cloud-native SaaS. All of the companies that are part of Mock are cloud-native SaaS. They're building software as a service uh, services, and everything's headless. Headless is just another word for API first. Um, doesn't mean that these things don't have front ends. They all do. We'll talk about more of that uh, later. All right. That's what Mock stands for. What does it mean to actually be Mock compliant, from my opinion? Um, so it's yes, it's SaaS solutions only. So the on-premise things where you buy software that you have to install on your server or you install it in your cloud is not Mock compliant. And I really, uh, Agility, for instance, has never been that. We toyed with the idea of, hey, you can install a, your own version of Agility on your own servers. I think we did it for one customer, and it was so difficult to do upgrades that I said, I'm never doing that again. I think it was, I can't remember, it was like a government contract. Um, that was also difficult. But the idea of, you just have one version of everything. That's so much easier to do. Um, and we just, we just said, hey, we're gonna be like Google. Everyone goes to the Google homepage, they get the latest version of Google. There's not what version of it are you on. Now there actually is for some of it, but that's a whole different story and you can do feature flags and all that sort of stuff. It gets complicated. But there's one version. And APIs for everything. This means everything. And it's really, really important to understand. It's like if you're building a piece of software, Think about the APIs that you can be building into it to make it really, really useful. It can make it last a lot longer. Um, and independently scalable offerings. This is interesting too. So if you build things as microservices, then you, and if you have, say, a bunch of different things that your software does, if you can scale them independently, first of all, you might say that, oh yeah, we have a, just like I did, we had a commerce and we had UGC and we had CMS. And it's like, wait, this is the one that everybody wants. We're gonna scale these down so they don't cost us that much, but keep, keep them running. We're gonna scale this up because everybody's using the content. Um, the CDN origin is another one. It's a different service, very simple, but it's independently scalable. So not only is it smart, because as a business, that's how you can do it, especially if you're doing cloud, but it also means that you are, this is sort of fit in with this, this version of what was a good way to do software. My opinion is that SaaS in 2023, from a business point of view, tends to all be all about enterprise, for better or worse. Um, and Mock is like, hey, are, are, is the software that you're gonna use, is it Mock compliant, is becoming a kind of a checkbox? Um, I don't know if any of you have worked in like the procurement of software, or you either, either from a selling point of view, like you're trying to get someone to procure your software, or you've been buying other software. You have these, all these like checkboxes, security checklists. Mock is becoming one of those for enterprise specific. So what does this mean for you as a web developer, or some sort of, maybe you're not a web developer, but you're a developer of some kind, uh, what kind of solutions are you building? This is what people tend to say that they're building. It may, it may or may not be true. A lot of people say they're building websites. I'm building a website. A uh, website or a web app that runs in a browser. Pretty, pretty standard, right? I'm building a mobile app, you know, iOS or Android, maybe it's on React Native, something like that. This is, this is what has become, you know, in the last sort of 10 months. I'm building an AI app, which is almost always a chat GPT wrapper or a, some kind of function around there, um, for better or worse. Now, anyone building an AI app that's not that? No. Interesting. Um, I'm an AI developer, by the way, because I've built that because it's super cool and super fun. Um, but even a website, even the most basic of websites usually needs some kind of back end for that front end. And if, if, if you think of a website as a front end, um, and even an app that runs in, in, in a handheld device, it almost always has something on the server to load something dynamically, whether it be login or something. So there's always a service involved. So what should you consider building? <laughs> you should consider building those services. Even if it's just for your website, think of it as a, a booster for your career. How can I build this? Do I need to build a service here? Or is this, is this strictly just a front end? Be very wary of building what they call a monolith, where everything's inside one big like PHP or Java app, and then you can't really pull that apart if you wanted to separate it later. You can't independently scale it. Uh, it's harder to install, harder to upgrade. All those things become harder. If you have a few services that are, are being called as APIs, now you've built a product. Totally different way to look at your career. Um, and so when you think of yourself as a product developer, 
The difference to me between a project and a product is a project, I finish it, it goes out the door, and somebody, owns, somebody else owns that code. And that is one way of doing things. And I actually, when I hire folks, I've got Dakota in the, in the crowd there, one of the questions I asked, are you a product person or a project person? And some people are project people. And that's cool too. You like to do a different thing, and maybe it's a two month, three month thing, I code it all up, and it's out the door, and I don't have to look at it anymore. It's gone, it's somebody else's thing. But product people, which I think is, is more people tend to actually be product people, they like to see it evolve, and they want to come back and tinker with it, and maybe like upgrade it to a new version and get it all going in, in different ways, that kind of thing. So think about building a product. I really think it's something that you could think about. Almost every product has some kind of data in storage, just from a technical point of view. A SQL Server or something like that, data lake is something, some kind of replication of data coming around. That's usually like low-level stuff. Cloud's really good for that. Some kind of service, right? This is the thing. That's the APIs. That's the, the real, real thing. Some kind of back-end for front-end, maybe. So you might have like a little intermediary layer there. And the dark purple is the front end. So the dark purple stuff is what most developers actually spend most of their time building if they're saying they're building a website. They're actually building front end and back end for front end. And the services thing is where that's where the real products tend to be. Now, what's really interesting is you think of a composable solution. We actually think of composing services. We don't tend to think in composable front end. So as a developer, I see this. As a front end developer, I'm like, what is this? So these are potentially all the services, and this is just a few. This is like, what, not that many of them, but I always put headless CMS in the middle, by the way, um, that you might use to build your front end. So you could build a really complex front end with all of these things and not really have to do that much in terms of building your own services, okay? Um, so yeah, it's like, maybe you're, but even the, just pulling apart headless CMS, just take one service out of that piece, and I know exactly how this is built, because I've done it, it has data, it has its own services, and that's what people actually pay for, right? When you buy headless CMS, you really want that, that content service. It has a BFF, and it has a front end. Um, and each, each tier of that has people that work just in those tiers. Some people are full stack, as in they work in all those different things. So if you don't understand what full stack means, that would mean it's like, hey, I could do the SQL, I could work on the services that are on the back end, I could work on the, the front end parts as well, you know, maybe the, the stuff that's gonna be actually be you know, in the browser, that kind of thing. So each product, each little mini service that you might be building is itself a full, a full stack solution potentially, okay? So when you're building your thing, what services does your solution need? First of all, this is what you should be asking yourself as a developer, like what do I need to build to, to put together to compose my solution? But then also, well, what do I need to build to, that you know, no one else has this, the, quite how I need it. Maybe it's a special kind of identity provider, whatever. It's maybe some, some thing into your back end. Maybe you've got a great database of like hockey statistics that you want to make as a service for your own thing, right? So why not build it as like some kind of mock compliant thing? Just look at the mock sort of compliance uh, guidelines and just do that. Because if you build it, they will come. Everybody watch this movie from the 80s? It's such a great movie. The cool thing is they actually did build this stadium and they played uh, games here, and it was like the most watched MLB game on TV. So it's really interesting that it's like, it is true, if you build it, they will come, and you never know how popular that service will become if you build it. So front ends, they do come and go. And I guarantee you, if you're working on a front end now, you will rewrite that, or someone will rewrite that and throw it away in a few years. Or maybe it'll be seven years, but it will, it will get rewritten. Services endure much, much longer. For, so for your computer, uh, <laughs> for your uh, career, I should say, as a developer, think about services. Definitely front ends are awesome, and yes, build them, but understand that those services are things that last a lot longer. Let's look at Joel's career report. The 2023 UI of Agility has been out for three months, so not very long, just in terms of a front end. The 20, 2015 UI was out for eight years. It lasted way too long. Okay, let's, there's an asterisk beside that. It should never have lasted that long. Um, but in, be in the back end, there's a fetch API. It's four years old and running on .NET. The UGC API that I wrote, oh my gosh, in 2010, still going strong. It hasn't actually had any code updates in way too long, just like just fixes and stuff. It's going for 13 years. The .NET Sync API that Agility was first based on is 17 years old. It's, the hardest thing is finding someone that can still run, work on .NET code that old. Um, luckily, there's still cool people out there like Mohit and that, they're like awesome guys, um, great folks. But 
So when you think of it, it tends to be the things that are services last a lot longer, and you can build a career on a service that you weren't even sure about. That .NET Sync API was like just an idea, uh, an idea back in 2005. Let's build this API, it can sync, it'll make websites really fast, it's gonna be great, and it lasted, and I built my entire career on that. So you can build, you're gonna build or use composable services for your front end, and if you start Using more of these composable services, you can think of each service, first of all, like its own product, whether you built it or not, um, and have a kind of a product mindset about that. So, you know, only, as I said, only the most basic of websites are not going to need any kind of services whatsoever, okay? If you're going to build a service for your product, for your website or whatever it is, maybe it's an app, really work on defining what that is. Keep it simple. Uh, understand what, what that's gonna need to have in there. Right? Think about how you're going to scale it, because if it, if it is worth your time, people will use it, and it may blow up in ways you'd never thought about. So that asset origin that I actually didn't even put on, on the diagram, the asset origin has been around 17 years as well. Um, somebody just tried to hack that this morning, actually, which is interesting. But it gets like godzillions of requests. I don't even know how many, I, I, I do have the number, but it's so much, so much data is coming through there, it's incredible. Um, it's a very simple service. It's probably, and it's the service that for agility actually makes us the most overage money because it's all the bandwidth. So you never know what that service is gonna be that you will build. It might be super simple, but definitely it should be super scalable. And think of yourself as an architect. This is your opportunity. Have an idea. If you have an idea of the service that you're gonna build, you, are, you just became an architect. Think, build your little stack, build a pyramid of all the little things and start with your back end. Maybe start with the front end in terms of your mind, but down at the back end is how you actually store things and do some analytics, and then you build a service on top, all that sort of stuff. That's your opportunity to become an architect. And that's really how you can have that product mindset to build those things that are gonna last a long time in your career and won't just be kind of out the door. And then assemble your solution. So what, what, what do you need in your solution? You know, in this one, we had all these different pieces, but you might not need all these things. You might not need you know, personalization, maybe you don't need CRM. You know, but maybe you're gonna put in your own custom service as part of this. So that's an interesting way to do this. Um, now, I will tell you, this happens very often in the process, especially for enterprise software, depending on where you're working. If you're kind of saying, oh yeah, we need a new website or we need a new thing, this is what we're doing, we're building. It could be that there's a wolf in sheep's clothing, okay? So, I don't know if you guys see Looney Tunes. Um, keep a sharp eye out for those, because there are a lot of services that have been around a long time that say that they're uh, SaaS sort of software that aren't. So just be careful of that when you're composing your solution and understand that everything does evolve. Remember, remember this thing about all these frameworks? Each one of these frameworks has its own like different versions that come out. Dot, the .NET Core uh, of like you know, four or five years ago is completely different from the one that you know, is coming out. .NET 8 comes out in like November or something, right? Um, you know, Next.js, like, if we talk about these, oh, I got little animations for those. Next.js, like 13.5 is like leaps and bounds different from the Next.js of like 10.0 that came out and previous versions of that. Um, and you know, everything's got its own history and all that sort of stuff. So it, it kind of behooves you to learn about these frameworks, to think about composing your solution, and then kind of work with all that knowledge as you do. So maybe you're building a website, maybe you're using Next.js for that website. It's cool, I highly recommend it. You're probably gonna have, usually, some kind of headless CMS. Maybe you're gonna say, I'll build my own. That's cool, good luck. Um, but oftentimes, you're gonna have custom service, some custom thing. I've got my hockey stats database that I've been building and working on, and I'm gonna build my hockey stats thing, and maybe I'll do that on .NET, even though this is Next.js. That's okay, right? It's actually sometimes a good thing to kind of like experiment with different technologies, because you will not build a monolith if you pick different technologies. You just can't, right? They can't be in the same solution that easily. Um, but where you host it too, I could, maybe you're building your custom service, it's gonna live in Azure, because that's where your data might be. Maybe I'm using like a SQL Server database for all my data, it's in Azure. Let's build the service in Azure so it's close. But my website, I'm gonna host it maybe on like a Netlify or a Vercel, because I can host it for very, very inexpensively there and just try it out for free and get started with it there. They would love to, all of these places would love to upgrade you to enterprise at any time, by the way. But 
And by the way, if you're interested in Next.js in 13.5 and hosting, actually, join my workshop on Tuesday where I'll actually go through a Next.js solution with you on the latest version, the latest and greatest, which is cool. All right. Well, that's the end of my show. Oh, my gosh. That's it. Did I, did I do it okay? Hey, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you join me over here. That was, I'm, I'm very glad that I was like standing there ready. That was, was very sudden. <laughs> you click next. I seriously <laughs> thought there was another slide there. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but. So uh, this is, I, I actually, I love this because Mock Alliance has, has sort of been um, kind of making some rumblings. And it seems like Mock Alliance is on the rise at the same time as like Jamstack, which is sort of a, a lot of the same concepts is sort of fading from the, the popular lexicon. So are there material differences between Jamstack and the Mock Alliance, or is, is Mock just Jamstack in a Patagonia vest? Yes. The second <laughs> one. The second one. The second one. I honestly, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the Mock Alliance was started, um, it's, it's started more of a European thing to be, hey, let's, we're, we're kind of composable services, let's work together and in, in sort of like have a unified message about how we're going to talk to the world about this, mm -hmm. okay? Whereas I don't think Jamstack, Jamstack was much more of a grassroots feeling type of thing, and I still believe in Jamstack. I'm 100% for the Jamstack. I'm a Jamstack guy. Love it. Um, that's how I kind of got out of .NET and into this, and I love how it's kind of evolved into enterprise so that developers can actually make money doing this mm -hmm. and that companies won't go under and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so... A little bit of a, of a tough question here. Uh -oh. Earlier this year, Prime Video announced that they reduced mm. costs by 90% by moving from microservices back to a monolith. Yep. Uh, what's your take on, on what that means for something like Mock? Well, I'll tell you, when we moved Agility from bare metal to, um, to the cloud, it was really hard, really hard to get any kind of performance. Um, and, I, and if I thought it would make sense for us to move back, I would move back to bare metal for performance in a second. So it is always gonna be way more performant. And for a specialized service like that, I think it makes total sense. But one of the things that we're not totally sure is like, is all of it, is like, is the front end still on that? Or is it just certain back end? Is it just the video mm -hmm. delivery? Is it just the video encoding? Because that's certainly gonna run faster on bare metal. So we don't necessarily have all the information. The one I do know about, um, because I followed, followed some of these careers on, on Twitter and, and through sort of like, just different blogs, is Stack Overflow is a great example. It's a monolithic web app running on bare metal, mm -hmm. not on VMs, not on serverless, and it serves like gazillions of requests really, really well, not even through a CDN. So how do you do that and get that to work? But that's like a team of 50 engineers all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas serverless, you don't have to worry about the VM, oh, sorry, the operating system, you have a VM, it's even more abstract. You don't have to have any operating system. It's just so much easier and faster to get started. So I think it actually makes sense, it's a logical, progression of a service where you start serverless because it's easy, quick to get started, and also really cheap to fail if it doesn't work. By the way, fail often, it's cool, I've failed a lot, um, and it helps you grow. So service is great for getting started on that stuff, you can learn how to scale it, and then you may come to the point where, hey, I'm Prime Video now, mm -hmm. by the way, that's successful, and then, hey, now we need to go to bare metal because we can't afford the bills anymore, and I think getting that, that first, oh my god, our Azure and AWS spend is like, a way more than we thought it was, that's a kind of version of success where you just need to now, you know, iterate and, and sort of get a little bit better at what you're doing, and maybe that means, hey, we're going to move back on-premise for some stuff. Uh, I think that's, and it's all okay. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, it's also, it's worth, like, the economics of this change as a company grows, because when you're small, if you're not spending more than $150,000 a year on your, your cloud, it's still cheaper than hiring the $150,000 a year engineer, right? Yeah. So it, it's, you know, Amazon is a different beast than a five-person startup, and, and yeah. I think that, like, be, be measured in... <laughs> totally, yeah. There is nothing worse than having to, having a bunch of servers where you have to have somebody in charge of updating the OS on those things if mm -hmm. you're a small company. That's yes. really hard from a compliance or SOC 2 point of view or ISO, really hard. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, you said that every FE in your pyramid has a BFF, but it's very hard <laughs> to make friends as an adult. Uh, any suggestions for making a new BFF? Hobbies. 
<laughs> get a hobby. <laughs> That's why I always start with like, what are my hobbies? I love football and I love musical theater. By the way, being in this theater is this is a, just a beautiful venue. This is awesome. But like, get a hobby and talk about your personal life with the people that you work with. I love that you answered that question sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> um, it means a lot to me. So, what skills should a dev prioritize if they want to take advantage of the mock architecture? Read. Uh, come to these things. Uh, so the skill of learning is the biggest one, mm. um, which is why, like, when I hire, I don't, uh, I don't hire necessarily someone who has a comm science degree, although that typically shows that you're really good at learning how to learn, but just are you good at learning things and learning new things that may, like, invalidate what you learned before? It's like, oh, yeah, we can move on to this new idea because, boy, it's awesome and it's easier or whatever. Um, and then I... Just try out different services. A lot of them are available for free. Like, it's why Agility has like a free trial. So you can say, yes, this is for me, or no, it's not for me, for free. It's just your time. And your time is valuable as a developer, but you should spend it learning and trying things as opposed to trying to say, the stuff I already know, I can really, really do it. And then your, your, your pathway becomes narrow. So open up your pathway by learning more. Mm. I like that. Open up your pathway. That's a good That's I a just good made visual. that up. You can, you can use that. <laughs> We've got one from Jessica. I'm already upset. My understanding is that mock speeds are illegal over residential areas. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Do you think this limits the effectiveness of the mock alliance? Uh, if you can hear the electrons going by, I think that you, uh, you're setting a world record just for sensitivity. But uh, no. <sighs> Can we get somebody to escort Jessica from the building? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so how does adopting a, C a headless CMS change the day-to-day -day working experience for a front-end dev? Oh my gosh. It changes your life completely, especially if you're that person where like the the business comes and like looms over you to make changes. So I think that's the biggest thing is it empowers you to just, you just build the components that your front end website or whatever will need and then somebody else assembles that. That's what the workshop on Tuesday is all about is actually looking at how a front end dev does that with headless CMS. It should change your life. It won't necessarily do that de facto like automatically because as a developer, we tend to think different from like the business or marketing. We don't necessarily understand how marketing is going to use what we build. So definitely like have those conversations with the people in the other departments who maybe they were over your shoulder or sending you Slack messages or Word docs with all that content that they wanted on your website. Think about how they want to be editing that website later when, you don't, when you're not in there. Otherwise, you're going to be in the code just as much as you were before. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you manage the negative trade-offs of, of microservices architecture? So, um, you know, the, the trade-offs being you're going to have increased network latency, there's maintenance overhead because you've got multiple services instead of a monolith, uh, risks of things like cyclical dependencies. Um, how are you kind of building against that? Yeah, great question. And, and in my career, I really resisted, we used to call this service-oriented architecture. Mm. And it used to be the idea that everything should be a service and not everything just calling back to the database. I'm like, well, the database is right there. It's so much faster. Why do I have to do the other thing? Um, but if you think about your stack of your service being that thing that is fast, and that's where the latency matters, then yes, it's important. So I see a lot of stuff out there of like, oh, we have this um, database that's like a regionality database so you can be close to your data with your front end, right? Well, I like to think of it as, well, if I'm gonna build a service, I can build that in whatever cloud I want, and like an Azure or, or an AWS, those are the two that I, or Google Cloud, you can build it in. And as long as the data is in that cloud, in that region, then you're okay, and you can use CDNs or whatever after that. There's a ton of different ways to architect things, but as long as the latency of your service within its own requirements, it's in its own dependencies is fast, you're, you usually are pretty good, and then you can optimize after that. You're absolutely right. If I, if I built a monolith like Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow might not work as a set of microservices that talk to each other. It, it certainly wouldn't work in the current architecture. So there's the right way and, and lots of wrong ways. There's lots of right ways too. It, it, so it depends. 
Uh, I hate that answer, but it's, it's like it's not, it's not the end of the conversation to say that there's increased network latency. In my experience, especially in recent years, um, with how much better CDNs are now, how much better front-end frameworks are, um, and how that latency has kind of like, it's kind of gone away as a problem in, in the sort of the systems that I've helped folks architect over the last few years, just because of the difference of the service, the different ways that the service architecture works now um, with, with, ten, with mock uh, compliant type things. Doesn't mean it's not a problem, it absolutely is something that we should be considering all the time. So those are all a great list. In addition to that, um, are there other challenges or, or downsides to shipping a microservices style architecture yeah. that devs should be thinking about if they're gonna go this way? The, 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 I think one of the biggest pitfalls of microservices is it's really easy to build really quickly. So we can do the developer thing that we like to do, by the way, almost no one put up their hand as an architect, which is maybe you just don't think of yourself that way, but if you thought of yourself more of an architect, then you'd probably do a diagram before you started doing the typing. And if you do a diagram, then you can build out a sort of, an, a sort of high level topology or whatever you want to call it, a map of the services that you're going to need. But you can really easily just crank out a microservice that does one little thing, and then I could do another one, and another one, and another one. And before long, I don't remember, how did I do that one? What was that doing again? And so it's almost too easy. Easy is great for learning, but once you get to a, a full sort of service solution that has to have all those things in the stack in it, you really need to do like a good diagram, think about the architecture. It doesn't mean you need to take a, like a degree in computer science to do that. Draw a picture with boxes, and so you can remember and you know, teach the other people on your team what you're doing, and they will have opinions. And now, our microservices that maybe they're exact same code, but we remember what they all do. And we can think, oh, you know what? Let's actually not do different services for all these different things. We can have one service that does, you know, like maybe the same job in two slightly different ways. It's one just it's one service, so we don't have that. Like, it's easy to build a thousand microservices that you really can't keep track of, and all of a sudden one blows up, and your Azure bill becomes like uh, way more than you thought. So it can get out of control if you're not uh, on top of it from an architecture point of view. Yeah, I think it, architecture is also one of those things that like it's easy to tell yourself that you're not something, but anytime you build anything, you're architecting yeah. it, right? And like you're always planning. You can just either choose to do it up front or do it after something goes wrong. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's let's talk about the mock alliance itself. So you talked about being mock compliant. Yep. Um, so other than just being part of the mock alliance, is there any way to know that a service is mock compliant. And, and also, we heard earlier uh, yesterday about composability. Mm. And is the mock alliance and composability, are they the same? Are they compatible? Like, what, how do those fit together? Every, so how do you tell if someone's mock compliant? They're listed on the mock website, okay. mockalliance.org, I think. Um, so they're listed on there. Um, it's a growing list. Um, it's pretty exclusive, like you have to go through an audit. By the way, has anyone have, had your software audited? It is brutal. It's like, <laughs> it's not like a tax audit, not quite as bad, but it feels like you, you kind of drop in your drawers for someone to look at the underneath parts. It's not fun. Um, but they do that to make sure that it actually is compliant, right? So that means that everything that's in the mock alliance is composable, right? Mm -hmm. There are a, a way more other services out there that are still composable, and things can be composable that aren't even a SaaS service necessarily. It could mm -hmm. be an on-premise thing that's still part of your composable architecture, um, but that's just gonna have a different set of like, requirements about using that in the long term and whatever. So if it's composable, it can be mock compliant, but that does not include the, the inverse where if it's yep. mock compliant, it, yep. or wait. How many of us are making Venn diagrams in our head right, right now? Yeah, I just like, broke yeah, my yeah, own brain. There's an intersection. Yep, for sure. Okay. All right. Well, I agree. No, we'll just we'll just pretend that I said <laughs> that in a way that sounded smart. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. If the, I I think that actually may have been the the last question that anybody asked. So we're gonna go ahead and call it there. Y'all, thank you so much. Let's give one more hand to Joel. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>